The Psalms are prayers and hymns of the Bible par excellence. Uttered in praise, joy, sorrow, and despair, spoken or sung in private and in public. By lay people, kings, poets, and priests, coming from both the righteous and repentant sinners, the Psalms have served as the prayer book and the hymn book. To generations of believers, for every man on every occasion can find in its Psalms. morning once again we are indeed grateful for how you continue to support whispering hope we thank you all of our viewers for being back with us once again on this beautiful tuesday morning we are here to look into god's word and before we do that we're going to take care of some business so i'm going to sort of welcome elder david and elder gordon this morning on the platform to greet you folks and elders how are you all doing for the week so far well my, my week has started out great i'm giving god thanks and praise you know in spite of the bombs and the obstacles it is indeed wonderful to just praise God. And especially during the book of Psalms, I think it has enriched my life to such a point that I'm seeing myself like David over and over again. In spite of the obstacles, I just give God praise and remember that he deserves the highest praise. Welcome, everyone, and good morning to one and all. Amen, amen. Nice to have you, Elder God. Elder David? Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome. I am just thanking the Lord for his goodness towards me, even though periodically there are little hiccups. But I'm alive. I'm experiencing fairly good health. But I am for that, I am thankful to the Lord. Happy to be here this morning again. And I trust that we'll all receive a blessing as usual. Excellent. Excellent. It's good for us to stay in good health and to let the Lord preserve us. But do all that we can in our power and the Lord will do the rest. So I'm glad to know you're in fairly good health, Elder David and Elder Gordon as well. Our lesson for this week, lesson number four, is entitled, The Lord Hears and Delivers. Well, the Lord definitely hears and delivers. But before we get into our lesson, I'm going to ask Elder David to give us a word of prayer. And then, Elder God, you're going to take the memory text for this week. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are thankful, dear God, to you for your manifold blessings toward us. Thank you, dear God, for your loving care. We thank you, dear God, for providing for us. We thank you also, dear God, for the opportunity, the privilege we have to come and to discuss your word this morning. We invite your Holy Spirit to come by and to be with us. May we all receive a blessing. We pray for those who are listening, those who are viewing this morning. Trust that we'll all be blessed as we study your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our memory text is taken from Psalm 34, verse 17, reading from the New King James Version. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Elder David, for the prayer, and Elder Gordon, for the memory text. Well, with such a rousing amen, Elder Gordon, you want to give us some insight into the memory text for that, that wonderful amen. How does that relate to our lesson? Or what insights can you bring from the memory text for, for this week? Elders and those viewing, you know, sometimes, especially as Christians, and we are bombarded. Sometimes we feel so alone. Sometimes we're praying, and it seems as if God is not there. But when we look into his word, you know, one evangelist call it God's love letter to human beings. When we look into God's word and this memory text says the righteous cry out and the Lord hears. That is such a reassuring, comforting thought and delivers. Not only hears, but elders, he delivers them. He delivers us. I'm going to change the word them to us. He delivers us out of all not some of our troubles not part of our troubles but he delivers us from all our troubles i think that is enough to say hallelujah thank you jesus amen amen indeed amen that's that, that that's a powerful word there elder, elder god <laughs> and they have to add to the memory text so should we move on just to say that it says the righteous cry out and when i look at the the verse before it says, his face is turned against those who do evil. And then in verse 17, it says, the righteous cry out and he hears them. So I, I couldn't help but wonder if there was a prerequisite or if there was a condition for God to hear us, for us to, I, it says to me that if we want for God to hear us, we must be willing to do his will. All right. Mm -hmm. Either we are living a righteous life or we are approaching him because we, we are desirous of living for him and the Lord will hear us. Absolutely. And I'm glad you used the word they're desirous. Because then if God would have only heard righteous people, then how could sinners come to him? But sinners are desirous of having a change in their life. I'm understanding from what you, I'm extrapolating what you're saying, Elder David, that those who have a desire to change, 
or to let God change them, God is going to hear their voice. But those who just want to remain as they are and not change or submit to Christ, well then, that's a different story. So thank you so much, elders. We're going to move into choose this lesson, this morning's lesson. And the title of the lesson is The Lord is a Refuge in Adversity. The Lord is a Refuge in Adversity. Let's look at some words here and some definitions, if you may. The Lord is a refuge in adversity. You know, when I was growing up, a young boy, I got two words mixed up. One word I saw at the side of the road or at a vacant lot, and the sign would say, do not dump refuge here. And then I stumbled upon the word refuge. Sometimes I was reading the Bible when I was a child. I was like, but wait, you're not supposed to dump refuge here, and God is a refuge in adversity? I mean... I do not understand. So help, help us understand, Elder David, what, what is a refuge or who is a refuge? How, define that word first so, so we can have an understanding. Okay. I, I think the sign that you saw might have said refuse. Correct. Correct. <laughs> but you know, like I said, that when we're young, you know, we mix it up. And we tend mm -hmm. to think it's one and the same. But there is refuse and there is refuge. To, to be refuge or a place of refuge is a place of safety. It's, it's somewhere where one goes for safety. All right, so safety. So the Lord is safety in adversity. We're going to read some passages of scripture. We're going to get into the, the meat of what we're here to study this morning. We're going to look at several Psalms, several passages, and we're going to pull up some questions from these Psalms. So first I want you, Elder Gordon, to find for me Psalm 17, verse 79. And... Elder David, Psalm 31, verses 1 to 3, and I will read Psalm 91, 2 to 7. And then the question is, what does the psalmist do in times of trouble? I think that answer might be already on the tip of our tongue, but let's read the back passages first, and then we're going to look at the question, what does the psalmist do in times of trouble? Elder Gordon, you first, Psalm 17, 79, then Elder David Psalm 31, 1 to 3, and I will read Psalm 91, 2 to 7. Okay. Read it from the New International Version. Show me the wonders of your great love. You who save by your right hand, those who take refuge in you from their foes, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who are out to destroy me, from my mortal enemies who surround me. And uh, Psalm 31, 1 to 3, from the New International Version, it says, In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress, fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. All right, and I'm going to read Psalm 91, 2 to 7. It says, from the King James Version, I will serve the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flyeth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. And so the question, elders, is what does the psalmist do in times of trouble? I'll start with you, Elder Gordon. In time of trouble, does David seek shelter, comfort, and protection from God? Now, the question could be asked as well. Why? Would he have gone to God? He would have gone to God because he, he had a personal relationship with God. Remember back then when David was a young boy, when he defeated Goliath. And even before he defeated Goliath, when Saul wanted to array him in all those armor and shield and so on, David, he put them on, but then he took them off because he felt uncomfortable. He did not test them. He never tested them before. He reflected on when he was there taking care of the sheep, taking care of the animal and he testified and said when the bear, when the lion seek to devour them that he used his bare hand it was God who delivered them by causing him to just rip them apart. So David had a personal relationship with God and I think it starts there. Someone cannot just because they're in trouble run to God where they don't really understand who God is. We have to 
Come and taste and see how God is good in good times. So when trouble come, when adversaries and, and so many perplexities comes our way, it is easy for us to go to God because here the text that I read, Psalm 17, 7 to 9, look how God, David addressed God. He says, show me the wonders of your great love. He is acknowledging that God is a God of love and he's pleading to God to show me I am in trouble. I know you're God of love. I know you deliver. He went on to say, because you, God, save by your right hand those who take refuge in you. So he was speaking to God on a personal a level. He knew who God is. He knew who God was then to him. And he could have pleaded to God because he know this is who God is. And so even to all of us, that's why it is so important, especially in these last days that we live in, that we come to know Jesus. We come to know God as our Savior and King. The Bible also tells us that those who live godly will suffer persecution. So when we study God's word, when we fall in love with him, when we would have tasted and tested him, and when trouble comes our way, then it's easy enough for us to say, God, I know who you are. You promised to deliver me, and I am now in trouble, and I'm asking you, God, because this is who you are. You deliver those who come upon you. Excellent. Excellent. Elder David? Yes. I think Elder Gordon alluded to what I had in mind. Now, he sought refuge in God. He had to first know and understand that refuge could be found there because it is not all of us today when we find ourselves in trouble, in adversity, in adverse situation that we run to God. Some people try on their own to deal with whatever uh, situations come their way. So it is vital and Elder Gordon uh, alluded to the fact that is because he had a relationship. So we have to first know, we have to trust in God. We have to know that refuge can be found in there. All right, you have to know that refuge can be found in him. And I mean, I think in, in Hebrews it says, he that cometh to Christ must believe that he is and that he's reward of them that diligently seek him. So we've got to believe and trust in God. But I'm staying with you, Elder David. What about in times in which we are not having adverse situations? How do we manifest or how, what should we do then? Let's say everything is it's hunky-dory, as they put it. How do we relate to God then? Or do we only call on God when we have trouble sometimes? You know, we are studying the Psalms now. And if you look at the Psalms carefully, you recognize that it is not only when the Psalmists were in trouble that they called on God. There were times when they were experiencing goodness in their lives. And the soul, and they called on God still. They cried out, they cried out to God in praise and worship and adoration for his goodness. And it is always good to live in an attitude of gratitude to God. And sometimes, you know, I always like to tell people, seek God when things are good, when the weather is fair, figuratively speaking. Because when things are good with us and, and we forget God, and, and incidentally, when things are going well with us, it is then that some of us forget God. And sometimes God would have to put a stumbling block in our way to remind us that he is there. So I like to tell people that when you are living carelessly, you are in a way courting trials because that is how God sometimes gets your attention again. All right. So we ought not to only cry out when we are in ad adverse situations, but we also ought to recognize God's goodness to us. I always like to, when I get up in the morning, thank the Lord for another day. Sometimes we take it for granted. Thank you, Lord, for good health. All right. So we call on God at, at all times. Absolutely. Um, I can relate, Elder David, because uh, especially in our years of experience in life now, you know, we are not of the halfway, we're well, not the halfway mark of, of that big 5-0. And uh, I can remember when I was maybe late teens, early 20s, I just spring out of bed. I mean, because that's who I am. I just get up on my own. But as you get older in life and you recognize that, you know, you little aches and pains here, you know, you don't have a good measure of health, but, you know, you've seen a lot of things you recognize. Oh, thank God for another day, because you see all around you, so many people are falling, and yet still, you know, God has been good to us who have lived this long, at least on this earth, because there's so many who are passing. By. But let's move on. It's not about us. Elder Gordon, the psalmist refers to God using several different terms and images. For example, he talks about he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He used the word shadow. He used the word, the phrase hiding place. Yeah. Again, fortress or a refuge. And the Bible speaks about in Psalms about us being held under the wings of God, like an eagle spread her wings or like a hen spread her wings. And he talks about being the shield and a buckler for us. 
all these words, what, what do they, Elder Gordon, what do these images represent from the Psalmist culture or for us today? What do these images represent? How can we put all of those things together and, and summarize anything about God? I would basically say, um, David, he lived back then. You know how Israel, they had they experienced the dry desert, they experienced the hot sun. I mean, we complain now, but back then it was very hot as well. And so they would have understood all these images that are the metaphoric words using to describe. Yes, you talk about the mother, the hen, and even Jesus himself, God himself says, is Israel know that he is under his wings, he'll protect just as so a mother hen protects her chicks her chicken open the wings and shelter them and protect them that is how so it was a culture that he could identify with and so he could have used it and he knew his readers would also would have identified with such a metaphoric language that is being used but so elder if i could just go back to the question that you asked and tie it in with this also, for us to find refuge, we must trust the person. We can imagine that if you go to a home to seek shelter and you don't know the owners of the home, you're not a comfort, you're not comfortable with them, you know nothing about them. You can imagine when in the night when they put you go to the bed to sleep, that you probably would be a little uncomfortable, take a little while before you go to sleep because what? You're not accustomed, you're uncomfortable, there's no trust, you don't know them. And I so think too that they David too, even before he goes on to use the metaphoric languages to describe the level of protection, we must have a level of trust. And how trust comes? Trust is built in a relationship. As we grow together, as we prove each other and realize that how faithful the person is, we develop trust. And so it is also one of the tears that we need to use in having that refuge. You would not just collapse in the arms of Jesus in times of trouble if you have never tested, tested, and trusted in him. So I just need to place that one is an in as well. So yes, under the shadow of his wings, he is protected, he is safe, and the refuge, the strong tower. You can imagine during the war time, we know David was a man. The Bible said God tell him he could not build the temple because his hands were bloody. He was a war man. He fought a lot of wars, and so he would have understood the, the protection that a tower would give in those days. When the adversaries are coming, it is so protected to be in a tower. And so he could have related to God, you are my high tower. And he could have used all those illustrations to describe the depth, the magnitude of God's love and God's protection for those who seek to be protected by him. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Elder Gordon, for that. Elder David, I'm going to read two passages of scripture, and then I'm going to ask you the question as to what image is used here in these two passages of scripture, and what does it reveal to us? So the first one is Psalm 17, 8. I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. And Matthew 23, 37 says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. That's a summary, Elder David. What image is used here? Well, I think it's quite plain. And what does it reveal to us? I remember looking at a video of a hen and her chicks. There was a rainstorm that was about to come, and the chicks ran to the mother, and the hen opened her wing. And the chicks ran under the wing. And the rain came down. And the hen stayed right there in the rain. Got soaked while the chicks were under her wings, comfortable, protected from the rain. And and, and a few things came to me there. First of all, the, 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 as we mentioned before, the chicks knew that if they ran there, the mother hen would welcome them. It speaks to our knowledge again our trust in God to protect us, and God's willingness always to keep us under his wing. And when I looked at how the hen suffered being soaked in the rain and so on, it reminded me of, of how Jesus suffered, how God suffered by giving up his son to die for us. So the, the image there, again, speaks of God's love, his care, his willingness to always take us into his fold, under his wings, and to protect us. And we must always be cognizant of the fact 
that God is willing and we must always run there because there is protection in Jesus. Final question for you, Elder Gordon, as we rush to a close and one you'll give your answer for the question. You could always give your takeaway as well. We are studying that Christ is a refuge in times of adversity, but then there are those who are watching or those who may be thinking that, you know, I've been crying out to God in times of adversity and he seemed so far and distant and I didn't get the answer that I was looking for and things went south, things went bad. What words can you give to comfort individuals or to help them to understand that even when God may seem distant, that he's still there? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what comes to my mind is what we read of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were facing gruesome trial because Nebuchadnezzar wanted them to bow to the golden image. And upon their refusal, he basically threatened them. Let them know, or rather ask them, who is that God? Who is that God that can deliver you out of my hands? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have have stood up and faced the king and says to him, our God is able to deliver. And even if God chooses not to, we will not bow. I think all of us as Christians and even those who have a desire to serve him must understand that the sacrifice that Jesus came to make is for us is to finally take us out of this sin cursed earth and prepare a heaven for us. This earth is not our final home. This body temple is not our final place. And so God in his wisdom, and that is where trust comes. We know who God is. He may choose not to answer me in the way that I am desirous of being answered. He may choose not to deliver me. He may choose not to heal a mother, a father, a child from a cancer on a deathbed. He may choose not to, but at the end of the day, just like Job, we must understand. And Job said, though worm eat my flesh. He knew that though worm may have a party with this corrupt body, this corrupt flesh, that one day, God will make all things new. The Bible says in Thessalonians, when the trumpet of God shall sound the dead in Christ. So in other words, even though we are in Christ and we are sick and Christ choose to say, let my servant go to sleep, that one day when the trumpet is sound, we will be awakened in the twinkling of an eye. Paul went on to say, this mortal shall put on immortality. This corruption shall put on incorruption. And we'll be caught up together to be Jesus in the ear. And when we're in heaven or in the new earth, sin will not rise its head again. So there will be no need of heartache. There will be no tears. Can the Bible say, God himself will wipe our tears away. So while we're here on this earth, yes, we may pray, we may ask for something, we may ask for deliverance, and God may choose not to because he knows, listen, if this, if, if this person goes to sleep, no, maybe that person will remain a saint. But if we continue to live as in the time of Hezekiah, maybe would have, we would have been lost. God knows best. And I think having a trust and a relationship with him will help us to better understand that God knows best and he does what is best for his children. My takeaway is that we continue to trust him. We have powerful lessons. Our lessons are powerful. It tells us that in adversity, our God is our refuge, our God is our strength. And my admonition to all of us, let us continue to find comfort, solace, and protection in Jesus Christ. Excellent. Thank you, Elder Gordon. Elder David, your takeaway for today as we study this lesson? Yeah. As we go through life, as we live, we are going to face an adversity. We are going to face trying situations. But let's learn from David and the other psalmists in the Bible. We have them as our example. When David, for example, found himself in trying circumstances, he ran to God because there was refuge there. There was safety there. When we go through our trying circumstances, let us understand that we too can find refuge in Jesus. We can always run there and be assured that he will never turn us away. He will. He's always there to welcome us under the shadow 
of his uh, wings. Excellent. This is where we have to leave it, folks, for today. I want to thank Elder David and Elder Gordon for continuing to be a part of Whispering Hope and for looking into the lesson each and every week. Our God is a refuge in time of adversity, but not just in times of adversity, in all times. And so, yes, we run to him when we have challenges, when we have difficulties, and he's going to answer. He's going to hear and he's going to deliver. But let us also remember to praise God in times of goodness, in times in which we are celebrating the wonders of love and the blessings that we have. Let us celebrate God. Until next week, may you continue to grow in grace. May you continue to trust in God. Have a wonderful day. God bless you.